Chapter 6 There was all about us on the ship an air of great exuberance and expectancy. The soldiers were buoyant with optimism, as if they were embarking on some great military picnic. It seemed none of them had a care in the world. As they tended us in our stools, the troopers joked and laughed together, as I had never heard them before. And we were to need their confidence around us, for it was a stormy crossing, and many of us became overwrought and apprehensive as the ship tossed wildly in the sea. Some of us kicked out at our stalls in a desperate effort to break free and to find ground that did not pitch and plunge under our feet. But the troopers were always there to hold us steady and to comfort us. My comfort, however, came not from Corporal Samuel Perkins, who came to hold my head through the worst of it, for even when he patted me, he did it in such a peremptory fashion that I did not feel he meant it. My comfort came from Topthorne, who remained calm throughout. He would lean his great head over the stool and let me rest on his neck, while I tried to obliterate from my mind the sinking surge of the ship and the noise of uncontrolled terror from the horses all around me. But the moment we docked, the mood changed. The horses recovered their composure with solid, still land under their hooves once more. But the troopers fell silent and sombre as we walked past unending lines of wounded waiting to board the ship back to England. As we disembarked and were led away along the quayside, Captain Nichols walked by my head, turning his eyes out to sea so that no one should notice the tears in them. The wounded were everywhere, on stretchers, on crutches, in open ambulances, and etched on every man was the look of wretched misery and pain. They tried to put a brave face on it, but even the jokes and quips they shouted out as we passed were heavy with gloom and sarcasm. No sergeant major, no enemy barrage could have silenced a body of soldiers as effectively as that terrible sight. For here for the first time the men saw for themselves the kind of war they were going into, and there was not a single man in the squadron who seemed prepared for it. Once out into the flat open country, the squadron threw off its unfamiliar shroud of despondency and regained its jocular spirits. The men sang again in their saddles and laughed amongst themselves. It was to be a long, long march through the dust, all that day and the next. We would stop once every hour for a few minutes and would ride on until dusk before making camp near a village and always by a stream or a river. They cared for us well on that march, often dismounting and walking beside us to give us the rest we needed. But sweetest of all were the full buckets of cooling, quenching water they would bring us whenever we stopped beside a stream. Topthorne, I notice, always shook his head in the water before he started to drink so that alongside him I was showered all over my face and neck with cooling water. The mounts were tethered in horse lines out in the open, as we had been on manoeuvres back in England. So we were already hardened to living out. But it was colder now, as the damp mists of autumn fell each evening and chilled us where we stood. We had plenty of fodder, mor fodder morning and evening, a generous ration of corn from our nose bags, and we grazed whenever we could. Like the men, we had to learn to live off the land as much as possible. Every hour of the march brought us nearer the distant thunder of the guns, and at night, now the horizon would be bright with orange flashes from one end to the other. I had heard the crack of rifle fire before back at the barracks, and this had not upset me one bit. But the growling crescendo of the big guns sent tremors of fear along my back and broke my sleep into a succession of jagged nightmares. But whenever I woke, dragged back to consciousness by the guns, I found Topthorne was always by me and would breathe his courage into, into me to support me. It was a slow baptism of fire for me, but without Topthorne I think I should never have become accustomed to the guns for the fury and the violence of the thunder as we came ever nearer to the front line seemed to sap my strength as well as my spirits. On the march, Topthorne and I walked always together side by side, for Captain Nichols and Captain Stewart were rarely apart. They seemed somehow separate in spirit from their heartier fellow officers. The more I got to know Captain Nichols, the more I liked him. 
He rode me as Albert had, with a gentle hand and a firm grip of the knees, so that despite his size, and he was a big man, he was always light on me. And there was always some warm word of encouragement or gratitude after a long ride. This was a welcome contrast to Corporal Samuel Perkins, who had ridden me so hard whilst in training. I caught sight of him from time to time and pitied the horse he rode. Captain Nichols did not sing or whistle as Albert had, but he talked to me from time to time when we were alone together. No one, it appeared, really knew where the enemy was. That he was advancing and that we were retreating was not in doubt. We were supposed to try to ensure that the enemy did not outflank us. We did not want the enemy to get between us and the sea and turn the flank of the whole British expeditionary force. But the squadron had first to find the enemy and they were never anywhere to be seen. We scoured the countryside for days before finally blundering into them. And that was a day I shall never forget, the day of our first battle. Rumour rippled back along the column that the enemy had been sighted. A battalion of infantry on the march. They were out in the open a mile or so away, hidden from us by a long thick copse of oaks that ran alongside the road. The orders rang out. Forward! Form squadron column! Draw swords! As one, the men reached down and grasped their swords from their sheaths, and the air flickered with bright steel before the blades settled on the trooper's shoulders. Squadron! Right shoulder! came the command, and we walked in line abreast into the wood. I felt Captain Nichols's knees close right around me, and he loosened the, the reins. His body was taut, and for the first time he felt heavy on my back. Easy, Joey, he said softly. Easy now, don't get excited. We'll come out of this all right, don't you worry. I turned to look at Topthorne, who was already up on his toes, ready for the trot, that we knew was to come. I moved instinctively closer to him, and then as the bugle sounded, we charged out of the shade of the wood and into the sunlight of battle. The gentle squeak of leather, the jingling harness, and the noise of not hastily barked orders were drowned now by the pounding of hooves and the shout of the troopers as we galloped down on the enemy in the valley below us. Out of the corner of my eye, I was aware of the glint of Captain Nichols's heavy sword. I felt his spurs in my side, and I heard his battle cry. I saw the grey soldiers ahead of us raise their rifles and heard the death rattle of a machine gun. And then quite suddenly... I found that I had no rider, that I had no weight on my back any more, and that I was alone out in front of the squadron. Topthorn was no longer beside me, but with horses behind me, I knew there was only one way to gallop, and that was forward. Blind terror drove me on, with my flying stirrups whipping me into a frenzy. With no rider to carry, I reached the kneeling riflemen first, and they scattered as I came upon them. I ran on until I found myself alone and away from the noise of the battle, and I would never have stopped at all had I not found Topthorn once more beside me with Captain Stewart leaning over to gather up my reins before leading me back to the battlefield. We had won, I had heard it said, but horses lay dead and dying everywhere. More than a quarter of the squadron had been lost in that one action. It had all been so quick and so deadly. A cluster of grey, uniformed prisoners had been taken, and they huddled together now under the trees whilst the squadron regrouped and exchanged extravagant reminiscences of a victory that had happened almost by accident rather than by design. I never saw Captain Nichols again, and that was a great and terrible sadness for me, for he had been a kind and gentle man and had cared for me well, as he had promised. As I was to learn, there were a few enough good men in the world. He'd have been very proud of you, Joey, said Captain Stewart, as he led me back to the horse lines with Topthorn. He'd have been proud of you, the way you kept going out there. He died leading that charge and you finished it for him. He'd have been proud of you. Topthorn stood over me that night as we bivouacked on the edge of the woods. We looked out together over the moonlit valley and I longed for home. Only the occasional coughing and stamping of the sentries broke the still of the night. The guns were silent at last. Topthorn sank down beside me and we slept.